Uh, if you guess this, I mean, I don't know if there's anything I can do uh, at this point. Uh, we're thrilled and privileged that you came to worship with us this morning. And just a little bit about who we are. We're a church that, that values both gathering and scattering. And what we mean by that is we value this. Uh, we, we think this uh, plays a central role in God's kingdom, that his people coming together to celebrate, to tell story, to be transformed by the scriptures. Uh, we think it's uh, incredibly valuable and potentially vitally important. And yet at the same time, we try to evaluate this. Uh, you know, we, we think of this as successful only if it helps us in the other six days in the way that we serve people and as my friend Brian likes to say in the way that we put a serving towel over our arm and just matter you know so welcome we would love to have a conversation with you and introduce you or answer any questions you might have like our theology on gambling um, <laughs> info card voicemail you can call the police I don't know whatever <laughs> <laughs> whatever it is that you would like to do. <clears throat> uh, you know that feeling when you have like, like two people who you really, really admire and you can't wait to introduce them? You know that feeling like a friend and a friend or like a, a parent and a friend? Uh, that's the way I feel this morning. I was just thinking that during the first service because my friend Brian is here and he's going to speak this morning about uh, Jesus. He's going to open the word for us. And, and that's kind of the way I feel. Like so proud of you, so proud of us. Uh, have so much respect for Brian and so proud of him. And so it's just kind of this... Maybe this is all about me and it's not supposed to be, but this special thing where I kind of get to introduce the two of you. Uh, personally, I've known Brian since I was 19 years old. We did accountability group together. We, I interned in a youth ministry that he worked in. I worked for him when he was the executive pastor at Harvest. Uh, we've experienced lots together, like summer camps with high school students and three years of traveling to Portland and staying on a Lipizzaner horse ranch while we stayed there. We were roughing it. Um, Professionally, I can say to you that um, I honestly don't know a better leader, incredibly equipped. My friend Fred, who I have the most utmost respect for, calls him the most emotionally intelligent, uh, emotionally healthy leader that he knows of, senior pastor that he knows of. Uh, and yet what I can say to you like eye to eye with um, absolute integrity is as, as amazing as he is as a leader and a communicator, uh, if you know him, you know that like interpersonally, like his character, is, it, he's, even, he's an even better person. So, would you give it up for Brian? He's going to unpack the resource. All that undo. All that. I don't know about all that stuff that Adam just said, but I just want to play poker. So, don't you? It just makes you want to play poker. It's super cool for me to get to be with you here today. Narrate, it's an honor and a privilege. And uh, the last time I was with you was... Um, uh, sitting out in the seats on grand opening weekend over in the other theater. And I just want to tell you that I'm sorry that I haven't been back since then. And because I haven't been back, I've missed out on a whole bunch of God's activity around here. And I've missed out on a whole bunch of your bringing of the kingdom of God right here to Helena. And so I just say to all of you, way to go. Way to go, narrate. And I want you to know that Journey Church is incredibly proud of you. And people all the time around Journey are asking, how's Narrate? What's going on at Narrate? And they're on your website, and they're, they sort of follow you and pray you and cheer you on. And can I just say, keep it up. I just keep it up. Adam is literally one of my favorite people in the whole world. And uh, it's a bummer that we don't get to live geographically closer to each other, but uh, the time that I do get to be with him, I absolutely love. And you couldn't have a better, more committed, more honest, more God-loving pastor than Adam. What a delight he is. What a guy. Take great care. Yeah, exactly right. <clears throat> we started Journey Church in Bozeman almost six years ago now, and we're, uh, we're like old now. Like six years old as a church like feels old. We're not so much a church plant anymore. We're all like established and we're working on like sustaining the organization. They keep talking to me about sustaining the organization. Doesn't that sound boring? And it's like startups are really, really fun. And so I'm a little jealous of all you guys are up to around here. Uh, and uh, so Journey's getting established. And, and uh, so, so am I. Uh, just on Friday, as a matter of fact, Dana, my wife and I, we celebrated our 11th anniversary. And that's a big deal because I am a high maintenance pain in the butt. And the fact that Dan has put up with me for this long 11 years is, it's really miraculous. I don't know what else uh, to call it. 11 years ago when we got married, <clears throat> I was very clear that I wanted to have two kids. And I put my fingers up just like that. I wanted to have two kids, just two. And I think God like uh, peeked down from heaven and just sort of chuckled at me like, ha ha, ha ha. Because there was exactly seven minutes back in 2004 when we had two kids. 
We had two kids for seven minutes. See, Bailey was born in 2002, and, and then so we had one kid, right? And then Dana got pregnant again, and we're not exactly sure how that happened, uh, but she did. Uh, and, and then Dylan was born in 2004, and then we had two kids. But then seven minutes after Dylan was born, his twin brother Preston was born, and we skipped right over the top of two, like from one to three, just like that, and we sort of never have looked back. This is a picture of our family that was taken uh, not all that uh, long ago. And uh, starting over there on the left, it, that's Malia, and then there's Preston on her lap, and then there's Silas, and then that's Dana, my wife in the middle, and this little Jasmine. She's our journey kid. She was born right when Journey Church was starting, literally as our third preview service was starting. She was born. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know, who's that guy in the middle there? And then there's Bailey, and then there's Dylan, and then there's Joshua, and there they are, all those yahoos. And I've been thinking about life a bit lately, especially this summer. And I've been thinking about uh, our family and my life and what I'm calling life at the crossroads. I've been thinking about life at the crossroads. And you know exactly what crossroads are, right? You know this because you're all doing it just like I'm doing it. You're careening through life at this altogether too frantic pace. And maybe in Helena, life is much slower. I'm guessing it's not that much slower though. And so you're careening through life. You have the accelerator of life mashed to the floor and you're going, 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 aren't you? And you're just trying to keep your head above water and you have jobs and you have bills and you have kids and you have surfing and you have family and your friends and, and you have all the stuff you know the deal right uh you're careening through life as a matter of fact just to sort of test you on this i'm going to say a phrase and see if you can finish it to sort of prove this careening through life thing i'm going to say a phrase and you're going to finish uh it okay are you ready time is money that he got it right those other ones those are really good answers I want to build your self-esteem. Those are really good answers, but time is money is the, is the correct answer. Good job. You get an A today. Wait, you were here for the 9 o'clock. That's not fair. <laughs> That's cheating, actually. We'll talk about cheating in a minute, actually. That time is money phrase is something that any person over the age of 13 can repeat, right? Why? Because it's such an ingrained part of this hustle and bustle culture that we live in. And because of this sort of bedrock cultural belief that time is money, what do we do? Well, we spend countless hours, we read countless books, we attend expensive seminars, all on the subject of managing time, using time efficiently, making profitable use of our time. All of that, however, contributes to us dealing with all manner of time pressure. We feel it squeezing in on us. We're trying to cram more in our day. We get up earlier. We work later. We take work home. We tote laptops around. So work is always just a few keystrokes away any time of the night or day. We have iPhones, smartphones, crackberries. So we're never ever out of touch. I actually saw this news report the other day talking about how literally addicting to us our smartphones are. And research shows the crackberry thing is not too far from the truth. A smartphone is as addicting as crack cocaine. A person inside of that study was actually quoted as saying, I'd rather have my hand cut off than spend a day without my smartphone. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? And how do we use them? We're phoning people while we're driving. We're checking and sending email like at 38,000 feet in the sky. This is unbelievable. And then we eat breakfast, lunches, and dinners with clients all in search of this sort of increasing Bottom line, more, more, more. And it becomes, life becomes all about performance, performance, performance. It's just the way the world works. And we're on the treadmill. To say it another way would be to say it this way. Let me put it in automotive terms. Most standard car engines, cars like you and I drive, turn around 4,000 RPMs. That's a revolution per minute. However, if you go to the Indy 500, race car engines turn around 10,000 RPMs. I want one of those. Do you? 10,000 RPMs. And so our culture screams in our ear. You should rev your performance, your productivity, your output to 10,000 plus RPMs from the moment that your feet hit the floor in the morning and keep the accelerator of your life absolutely floored. 10,000 plus RPMs until you fall into bed at night. And how many of us can identify with that? That's just life in America, isn't it? And it happens to me, and I know I'm a pastor, and I know I'm not supposed to do things like I'm about to tell you I did, but it happens because we're living life, 
and life is fast, 10,000 plus RPMs. Uh, we live out a little past Four Corners, if you know Bozeman, which is a little west of Bozeman. And so our trip to town takes us down Huffine Lane, which is a five-lane road, uh, two lanes each direction in the center turn lane. That the speed limit is 55 miles an hour. I was, uh, a few weeks ago, shuffling kids around town, taking kids here that you saw all those kids. So that, right, there's a lot of moving parts to that. And uh, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, I drive a 15-passenger van. It is so nerdy. <laughs> it is so nerdy. Like, oh my gosh, it's like embarrassing and I can't ever get Dana to drive it. I'm like, honey, how about you take the van? Not a chance. You ain't taking the van. And so people think we're Mormons and it's really, I got, I got, so I got a bunch of kids in there, and I'm careening down Huffine. I set the cruise control at 60 every time. I don't want to get in trouble. I just want to push the envelope a, a little bit so I don't go 55. I go 60, sometimes 61, and I'm in the slow lane, and I'm in a hurry. And I look 150 or so feet in front of me, and this little green Ford Taurus turns out right in front of me. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And this is a 15-passenger van. It's a lot like a school bus. It doesn't stop on a dime. And so I rapidly ap apply braking pressure to slow us down so we don't smash into the back of this woman. And, and she's going like 31, 32 miles per hour, 33, 34. I'm like, you have got to be kidding. And the fast lane cars are just zing by. And I'm like, why can't I, I can't get over there because cars are coming. And so I'm mad. This woman, she's talking on her cell phone, as a matter of fact, is impeding my progress. She's making me even more late than I probably already am. What are you doing? And so what did I do? That thing in the middle of the steering wheel, I applied heavy pressure to it. And I blew the horn a long time. Longer than I should have. And then I had this thought, sort of like, dash across the radar screen of my mind. What if this woman is a part of our church? I'm sure she's not, I said. And so I wait for a break over in the fast lane and I veer over and I get next to her and I look over and I'm going to give her a dirty look and I look and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's Sarah and she is a part of our church. <laughs> I dip my head so quick and I'm gone. Funny thing, I haven't seen her around Journey lately. I'm kidding, I think she's still around. That's life, isn't it? And we think that running at this intense pace, it can be rewarding can it? That feeling of adrenaline coursing through your veins, you're on a roll, your motor's racing faster and faster, it's fun, it's exciting, it's exhilarating, and you know what else? That kind of 10,000 plus RPM life leaves precious little time for taking life at the crossroads seriously. It leaves precious little time for thinking about the rest of our lives and how the choices that we make or the choices that we don't make, the choices we say yes to, the choices we say no to, how those choices, those decisions affect the rest of our lives and not just our lives, but the lives of a whole bunch of other people. I did a little dictionary work on that word crossroads and look at the definitions that I found. Uh, they're pretty cool, especially the last one. So a road that crosses a main road, right? We know that's a crossroads, the place of intersection of two. That makes sense. A small community located at such a crossroads, a central meeting place. But then look at the last one. A crossroads, a crucial point, especially where a decision must be made. And so here we all are. We're careening through life, pedal to metal, trying to keep our heads above water. We come to these points, and they're not just minor points, are they? They are not just minor points. They're crucial points, especially where a decision must be made. And we all face those crossroads, don't we? And those crossroads moments, they can actually set the course of the rest of our lives. And they can also set the course for a whole bunch of other people's lives as well. The choices we make at the crossroads of our lives decides some things for other people too. It isn't just us. And as I've been rattling around and reflecting on this life at the crossroads moment, my life, my family's life, our church's life, I've been doing this reflecting through the grid of what might be a familiar passage of Scripture, Mark chapter 10. If you've got a Bible, you can turn there. It'll be on the screens as well. Mark 10, starting in verse 17. I'm going to read it to you from the New Living Translation. The Bible says this. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem, a man came running up to him, knelt down and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you, you know the commandments. You must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, you must not cheat anyone, honor your father and mother. 
Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. And on one hand, that is a great narrative, isn't it? And on the other hand, it is a terrible narrative. And we hear this text an awful lot of times in the church talking about salvation, right? Talking about people coming to faith, choosing not to come to faith, saying no to Jesus in the moment of faith decision. And that is a fantastic application. But I want to sort of put a twist on it. I want us today to look at it a little bit differently because I'm wondering if God might not want to use this text from his word to be the grid through which we think about life at the crossroads, not, not just in matters of faith, but actually in matters of behavior as well as the grid through which we think about the rest of our lives and the rest of some other people's lives as well. Because what if for us today, part of the challenge from this text is for us to actually evaluate the benefits of getting in and getting on board with the redemptive movement of God here on planet Earth. To actually get in and get on to the active bringing of the kingdom of God to planet Earth right here, right now. It isn't just about heaven someday. It's heaven coming here now what that's like, and then also what it's like, what the consequences are of walking away from Jesus' invitation to participate in the redemptive move of God. What are the consequences of that in our lives? What are the consequences of that in the lives of other people? Because what if God's challenge to us today is what are you doing with God's invitations to you at the crossroads of your life? What are you doing? Are you saying yes or are you saying no? Are you going away sad are you leaving other people sad? Or are you going away filled with joy because you're in on the redemptive move of God? What are you doing with God's invitations at the crossroads of your life? Now, this text in the book of Mark, it's often referred to as the parable of the rich young ruler. You probably know it well as that. From the very first words of this text, we see this is going to be quite an exchange. This rich young man comes to Jesus and calls him good teacher. Now, that was an exceedingly rare address in Jewish literature. You know why? Because the rich guy is trying to flatter Jesus Christ, who happens to be the Son of God. He's trying to flatter him. He's trying to impress Jesus. I don't know how else to say it. He's trying to impress him with a brown nose compliment. Because why? He's hoping to be greeted with one in return. He's hoping to be greeted with a brown nose compliment in return. Because see, in the ancient world, one compliment required another compliment. It's sort of a dueling compliment sort of thing. A mutual admiration society, if you will. Oh, you're the greatest. No, no, no. You're the greatest. No, you're the greatest. With Jesus Christ. And you go like, really? Really? But Jesus doesn't oblige the guy, does he? He doesn't answer him, as a matter of fact, with any title whatsoever. And I hate this, and you probably do too, when God sort of bursts your bubble. Ever had that happen to you? When God sort of bursts your bubble? We come to him with all sort of flowery, over-the-top language, and we try to brown-nose God into doing what we want him to do for us. God, I've got these grand plans. I've got these elaborate schemes, God, for how you're really going to bless us. And God, I'm guaranteeing you're going to be a really big deal in this thing that I'm trying to do for you. People are going to see you really big. I promise. But I got to say, God, I'm going to be a pretty big deal in all this too. So God, if you'd please just get right on my thing, if you would, please. Would you get on my thing, God? And God, by the way, while you're at that, it would feel really good to my ego and my self-esteem if you'd please give me some affirmation that I'm almost as cool and big as you are. I'm almost as cool and big and special as you are, God, please. You sort of get the sense that God's stepping back, looking at us, going like, what in the heck? Really? And Jesus bursts this guy's bubble, doesn't he? You know, he says, only God is truly good, and I'm not blowing any sunshine up your tunic, sir. And what's true is that God absolutely loves us. He absolutely loves us, even in the moments when he bursts our bubble. He couldn't love us any more than he does in those moments. He loves us. He loves us so much he sent his one and only son to die for us. We have this astounding, unbelievable place in his unfolding redemptive narrative. 
We have this unbelievable place in the bringing of his kingdom through our lives. But we're not nearly as big a deal as we think we are, are we? And this guy wanted to hear how big of a deal he was from Jesus. And Jesus is like, uh-uh, God's good, the only one. And so then Jesus moves on to his question, Mark ten nineteen, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then the answer, but to answer your question, Jesus says, you know the commandments. You must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, you must not cheat anyone, honor your father and mother. And the guy's standing there sort of with his hands on the hips going like, yeah, duh. Heard all that before. Because all Jesus is doing there is quoting from the Decalogue, which is the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words, right? He's quoting from the Ten Commandments. That's all he did. He doesn't make any commentary on them. He says, you know the deal. Obey the Ten Commandments. Oh, wait a minute. Sort of back up the 15-passenger van for just a moment. Was it really the Ten Commandments or part of the Ten Commandments that Jesus laid out? Look at the verse again, Mark ten nineteen. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Right there. There's a twist. That law, you must not cheat anyone that Jesus recites there, is not from the Ten Commandments, is it? It is not from the Decalogue. It isn't. Now, it's a good command. We should all live by it. Don't cheat. But you see what Jesus is doing here is he's calling out those who participate in the economic exploitation of the poor. He's calling them out. He's talking to this very rich, very wealthy, much possession guy. And he's calling out the whole class of wealthy people who are exploiting the poor. And in the Greek, the words Jesus uses in that phrase, you must not cheat anyone, refers to the act of keeping back the wages of someone who has been hired to perform a task. They did the work, but you didn't pay them. Don't do that, Jesus says. And so then you see all of a sudden the story isn't just about this one rich man's personal failure, but instead it becomes Jesus addressing the wealthy of the world and how they treat their hirelings, how they exploit those in lower economic classes than they are. And this caused me to think back over the years to numerous, and I mean too many to count, conversations I've had with contractor friends. I don't care what kind of contractor it is, sprinkler, plumbing, general, landscaping. And you ask them, how's business? And they say, well, I'm busier than you can imagine. I got way more work than I could possibly do, but I just can't seem to get paid. And I go, well, what, what's that all about? And you press in with them, and this common thread emerged that these contractors would do work for incredibly wealthy clients. And if I mentioned some of their names, you would know their names, and then they would refuse to pay my contractor friends for the work that they contracted my friends to do. And it wasn't that they didn't have the money not to pay them. They just didn't want to pay them. They just wanted to hold on to their money. They just wanted to get free work, free stuff. And so that leaves... My contractor friends, maybe some of yours, maybe some of you, just trying to keep your heads above water, having to play bill collector with literally some of America's wealthiest families. And Jesus says, "Uh uh-uh. Don't ever cheat people you've hired to do work for you. Don't ever cheat them out of their fairly earned wage. Pay them. Pay them what you agreed to pay them. And so in this narrative in Mark 10, the rich guy, he, he just misses the bus entirely. He misses the point that Jesus is talking to him all the way back to the start of the conversation when Jesus goes, hey, buddy, only God's good. He just misses it. And so you see, the rich guy comes to Jesus. How do I inherit eternal life? Jesus says, who are you calling good? Only God is good. Keep the commandments. You know them. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't testify falsely. Don't cheat anyone. Honor your parents. And you get this sense that this rich guy's eyes are just sort of rolling as Jesus is talking, because you look at how he answers Jesus' challenge, Mark ten twenty. Teacher, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. I got that down. But he's missed the whole point. Jesus told him, no one but God is good. And this guy's going, well, I am. I am. I don't know about everyone else, but I'm good. I've done all that stuff, Jesus. You want to see my checklist? I've given myself a grade, all A's in all those categories. Here's my report card. And what this guy does in just a moment is he puts himself in this incredibly elite company of people by telling Jesus that he's blameless before the law of God. The Talmud, which as I understand it, is the Jews' document which explains the scriptures, what they mean, how to interpret and apply the laws. I've never actually read the Talmud. I'm not a very smart man. 
But they say the Talmud is not at all easy to read, which is why I haven't read it. They say it actually reminds you when you read it of someone else's notes taken from a college lecture that you've never attended. Ever tried that? (laughs) There's often in the Talmud gaps in reasoning where it's assumed that you already know what they're talking about. Concepts are sort of expressed in shorthand. Biblical verses that support teaching are referenced by only two or three words. And you're like, well, which verse is that? The Talmud, as a matter of fact, preserves a whole variety of views on every single issue and never actually clearly identifies which view is the accepted one. And so you're kind of left like, well, which one? What do I do with this? You're just supposed to know. I'm telling you all that because you see in the Talmud, in those documents, Abraham, remember these names, Abraham, Moses, and Aaron are reported to have kept the whole law. Abraham, Moses, and Aaron are reported in the Talmud to have kept the whole law. Now, you know those guys? Just little guys, right, from Christian history. Abraham, Moses, and Aaron. And you see exactly what this rich guy does with Jesus Christ. Standing there that day, he very calmly inserts himself into that very same rather exalted company. Abraham, Moses, Aaron, and we don't know his name, so we'll just call him the rich guy. Now there's four. I'm with them, Jesus. I'm good, And he does it like without even breaking a sweat. I'm as good as Abraham, Moses, and Aaron, as a matter of fact. I don't need to be reminded of the law. I've got that covered. And some of us think that we're good enough, don't we? We think we're good enough by ourselves to pass the righteousness test. And we become, all of us, me included, just like that rich guy. We think we've done enough good things. We think that we haven't done anything that bad. We haven't done anything as bad as they've done. We're as good as so-and-so, and and we're always measuring. And I'm just hypothesizing here. And so this is just, I'm just sort of flying this out there. I'm not saying this is exactly how it went. This is just a hypothesis. That sometimes in those moments when we're extolling the virtues of our goodness and our righteousness, that Jesus does the very same thing that I'll bet he did with this rich guy on this day that we read about in Mark chapter 10. Don't you just see, can't you just picture Jesus sort of standing back, shaking his head? Oh my gosh. gosh. You just picture Jesus sort of shaking his head going like, oh, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You can't do enough stuff. You can't do enough good stuff. It doesn't matter how bad the stuff is that you have. You need me, Jesus says. You, all of you, all of us need me because you're not even close to being good enough. And while we sort of hypothesize Jesus standing there shaking his head. The text reveals exactly what Jesus' feelings are in that moment. Did you catch it? Mark 10, 21. Looking at the man, the rich man, Jesus felt what? Genuine love for him. It wasn't manufactured love. It wasn't fake love. It wasn't conjured up love. Genuine love for him. And then he goes on. There's still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven where it really matters and then come follow me. It's a crossroads moment, isn't it? And Jesus says, he says to the rich man and he says to us, I love you, but you're not good enough. I love you, but you're not good enough. I love you, but you do not have it all figured out. I love you, but there's still one thing that you have not done and so you see you and i just like the rich man in mark 10 we have a choice to make at those crossroads moments don't we and the choice is are you going to get in with god and are you going to become a part of his global redemptive movement by doing something that some people might call radical are you going to get in with god are you going to say yes to him are you going to be like the rich man Who look at what he did at his crossroads moment. Jesus makes the invitation. Jesus makes the ask. And sure, it was a very expensive invitation. None of us would deny that. And look at what he does. Mark 10, 22. At this the man's face fell. Oh, that's not good, is it? At this the man's face fell. And he went away sad. Why? Because he had many possessions. It was too expensive 
for him. Saying yes at that crossroads was way too expensive for him. And so the question becomes for us, are you going to say yes to Jesus at the crossroads moments of your life? Or are you going to say, uh-uh, the price Jesus is just way too high. And some of us, we think that the price is too high sometimes, don't we? We've all said no to Jesus at some level, at some point, and we just say, hey, Jesus, I, I, no, I, uh-uh, I, I just can't do that. And that's sad, right? You calculate the cost of doing something radical Jesus is asking you to do, and you say, uh-uh, it's just too expensive, and it's sad. It's really sad. You miss out, absolutely. But you know what's really sad? And I've been noodling around on this a fair bit. What's really sad and what's absolutely breaking my heart, I dare say breaks the very heart of God himself, is that our no at life's crossroads moments costs not just us, it costs other people. It actually costs the people whom God has in mind for you to be a part of serving. And that's incredibly sad. Because they miss out on what God wants to conduit to them through you. I dare say that's tragic, even. God wants to use you in spectacular ways in the lives of other people. And you say, no, God, that's just too expensive. I don't want to pay that price. I got too much going on. Just a week ago, I was introduced to the ministry of a woman named Mama Maggie Gobrin. Mama Maggie, as she is affectionately called, she led a very comfortable life in Cairo, Egypt. She's a Coptic Christian from a very prominent Egyptian family. She taught computer science. She lectured at Cairo University. But at this crossroads moment with Jesus, she started a ministry to serve the poorest of the poor in her city. She's a Nobel Peace Prize nominee just this year, and she spent the last 20 years of her life serving the poorest of the poor. I invite you to watch this, if you would. Egypt is a country filled with ancient treasures, wonder, and history. It's also a desert, so it's hot. And its capital, Cairo, is densely populated with narrow, crowded streets. Oh, and the country is surrounded by some of the most volatile nations in the Middle East. Then, earlier this year, The government was overthrown amid civil resistance, demonstrations, and violence. To this day, Egypt is governed by their military, and the protests continue. Now, picture an entire group of people who eke out a living by collecting, sorting through, and storing the trash produced by this city of 20 million people. The metal, plastic, glass, and paper they collect can all be recycled for a few pennies, And a meal often consists of discarded food scraps and moldy bread. Some store the trash where they live. Others don't even have a home. They lack everything. And their identity as Christians means that they're shunned, even persecuted by the Islamic majority. Without basic education, hope, or someone to believe in them, it's unlikely that they'll ever experience life any other way. Maggie Gobrin, born into an upper middle class family, taught at the American University in Cairo, where Egypt's brightest could receive the best education in the country. But when her aunt, who had spent her life serving the poor, passed away, Maggie felt drawn to help fill the void that was left. The following Christmas, she visited a dump with gifts for the children. There she found them, sleeping amongst and inside the piles of rubbish. Resolving to do something about it, Maggie set up Stephen's children, named after the first martyr. Their purpose? To seek and to love those at the very bottom of the social scale, the poorest of the poor. Stephen's children takes a holistic approach to serving families all over Egypt with their spiritual, material, educational, physical, and social needs. They provide emergency relief, whether that's food, medical bills, or critical home repair. They also assist with education and job training. Stevens Children has over 1,400 staff members, serving over 27,000 families weekly. 
They operate 80 community education centers, which offer medical clinics and outreach to mothers. Each center hosts a kindergarten where up to 600 children are cared for at any given time. Here, they get food, health checks, clothes, and a Christian education. Thousands of children have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior as a result of the ministry. Mama Maggie, as she is affectionately known, has been referred to as the Mother Teresa of Cairo. And sources indicate that Mama Maggie has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize at least three times. But every chance she gets, Maggie Goldbrin points out the success of Stephen's children and the efforts of its volunteers and donors is solely due to God's blessing on their work. Can you imagine how incredibly sad it would be if Mama Maggie had said no to Jesus at that crossroads moment that she faced? Think about that. Think about how much worse off the dump children in the dump families of Cairo would be if she just said, "Uh uh-uh, that that would just be way too expensive. Heart-wrenching how sad that would be. And none of us know, absolutely none of us know what the people in Helena, what the people in Montana, what the people in the Northwest United States, what the people across the entire United States of America, what the people around the world miss out on that God wants to conduit to them through us when we say no at the crossroads moments of life that Jesus presents to us. We don't even know. Because way too often we're way too busy counting the cost, thinking about the price that we'd have to pay, and then walking away sad because we think the price is just way too high. Jesus says, look, you don't have to go away sad from those crossroad moments. You can stop leaving the people of the world, of your community, of your state sad because of what they're missing out on that God wants to conduit to them through you, and you can stop leaving yourself sad, leaving them sad, but just saying yes. Just saying yes to God at the crossroads moments in your lives. We faced one just a couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact. Around Journey, we do this thing called Summer of Hope. We bring orphans from Ethiopia and from the Philippines over for about five weeks during the summertime. We host them with host families who are at least a little bit interested in adopting, and so they sort of get to test drive what adoption would be like. The children have a chance to connect with people who might adopt them, the very least, They get a reprieve from the orphanage. They get to play and have fun and meet people who love and care about them. The program has about an 80% adoption rate, which is pretty cool. Well, this summer, there were five kids who came from Ethiopia, about four who came from the Philippines, and we're sort of watching the program from the sidelines and thinking, all is going very well, this is fantastic. And then one night, we went to one of the gatherings. They have these weekly picnics where people who are hosting and people who are at least moderately interested in adopting sort of mingle. And we took our whole family and our 12-year-old daughter, Malia. She's from Ethiopia. She met the girls who were here for the summer. And she started hanging out with them more and more, going over to their houses where they were being hosted. And then one of them in particular, she really gravitated toward, and I can't tell you her name because I get in a lot of trouble, and so I'll call her Addis because, well, that's her name. Her name is Addis. And Malia and Addis, they bonded. And we hadn't ever seen in a couple of years Malia in such a great place. It was like Addis awakened something in our daughter, Malia. My wife, Dana, she started doing a little snooping around the edges and found out that Addis's host family had no intention of adopting her. As a matter of fact, there was no one else across the whole Summer of Hope program, anyone else who she had met all summer, who was going to adopt her. And I'm sort of listening to this from afar, wondering, like, what, what's my wife doing? What, what's going on over there? I caught little bits and pieces of Addis's story. She's been in the orphanage since she was two. She spent a decade in the orphanage. No one's adopted her to this point. And it looked, from our vantage point, that even after the summer of hope, Addis was going to go home with still no hope of God helping her find her forever family. And I could feel this tug of God on my heart about this precious, beautiful girl that I'll call Addis because that's her name. But I didn't say anything to Dana. I just sort of kept it in. And you might even say I resisted. I didn't say anything. I found out later that Dana was feeling that same tug of God on her heart. 
And just a couple of days before the kids were supposed to go home, they have to go home whether they're uh, being adopted or not. They have to go back to the orphanage. And just a couple of days before they were going to leave, I said, I'm just going to take a flyer here. Honey, are we supposed to adopt Addis? And Dana, I mean, she just came out of her chair and she said, I thought you'd never ask. Yes, I do. I absolutely do. Deer in the headlights. And so there we were, our latest crossroads moment. Not at all unlike the one that Jesus offers to this rich man in Mark 10. And we had a choice to make. And I did the math. I counted the cost. We have seven kids. I sent Dana back to work full time when we brought Joshua, Silas, and Malia home from Ethiopia two years ago because our economic engine could not sustain a family of nine without that income. I counted the cost. Is $25,000 to adopt Addis. And it's money that we do not have anywhere. Not in the bank, not in a shoebox, nowhere. Not under the mattress. And then I had this little conversation with the Lord. What about her past, Lord? The orphanage for a decade. The repercussions of an institutionalized child for a decade. I, I, Lord, I don't. are we up for dealing with that? I, Really? Lord, can I be a good father to the seven kids we have right now, let alone an eighth? And we had this crossroads moment. Me and Jesus and Dana and Jesus and me and Dana and then all of us. As we were counting the cost of God's invitation as a family to adopt Addis, I was smack dab in the middle of ruminating on this text in Mark chapter 10. And one day it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I said, Lord, you know, I don't want to go away sad from this invitation. I don't want to be like this guy in Mark 10 who went away sad because he said no. I don't want to leave Addis in the orphanage for God knows how long, leaving her sad while she prays with all of her heart for a family to come and take her home. There's this crossroads moment. God's brought us to it. He's inviting us. It's a yes or no. Are you in? Are you out? And our decision is, well, yeah, we're, we're going to say yes. We're going for it. And it's expensive, and we don't have it all figured out. It'll be a wild up and down ride, I'm sure. But for us, the way we're choosing to think about this, and I'd invite you maybe to think in a similar way about your crossroads moment, is that saying no to God is way too expensive compared to saying yes. Saying no to God is way too expensive compared to saying yes. Jesus says you don't have to go away sad. You don't have to leave other people sad. Just say yes to me. Those moments, those crossroads moments, just say yes, would you? Why don't you close your eyes and bow your heads if you would. And I just invite you to go to prayer and just get real still and quiet. Just you and Jesus, have a moment. And if you'll let me, while your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I just want to press in with you a little bit. And I just want to ask you right here, right now, today, what's your crossroads? What's God inviting you to? And are you going to say yes? Maybe for you, you haven't even begun a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you've been on the bubble for a long time, but you've been counting the cost and you think it's just way too expensive. Can I just nudge you a little bit and say, what if today's your day? What if today's your yes day to Jesus Christ? Yes, Jesus I believe you. I believe you. You died on the cross for me. You paid my penalty. You took my place. What if for you it's a financial decision? Maybe to this point in life, 
Your whole goal has been to accumulate the biggest pile of stuff you possibly can before you die. You're living for retirement. What if your crossroad moment today is to just think differently about the resources that God has entrusted to your care? What if God's inviting you to amp up your generosity to your church, to your community around the world? He's inviting you to say yes to resourcing some stuff that he wants to accomplish and he wants to use you. Or maybe for you it's some initiative and God's put it on your heart and he's put it in your mind for a long time now and you've been telling him no, you've been pushing him off because you'd have to quit your job and that'd be expensive and you don't know how it would work and you don't know, you, you just, wow. And so a lot of people have been left sad because that new initiative just sits in your heart. What if you just said yes? What if you just said yes? And so Jesus, we say to you, thank you. Thank you for saying yes to us. Yes to the cross. Yes to loving me, us, when we're at our worst, when I'm at my worst. Genuine love for me. Jesus, I pray for the community called Narrate Church, that this would be a yes church at the crossroads moments. That they would decide in your heart, in their hearts, that it's just way too expensive to say no. And that they would say yes to you, Jesus.